I think one of the lessons of history is, unless the economy is of the people and by the people, it will not be for the people. It will be for whoever actually is running it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we've discovered sort of time and time again. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today our guest is Robin Honnell, who is a uh, professor of yes. economics at Portland State University, he used to be a professor at American University in Washington, D.C. He is uh, known for his um, work on participatory economics, and he is now author, well, he's authored about 10 books, either authored or co-authored about 10 books, uh, including uh, such titles as Economic Justice and Democracy, From Co Competition to Cooperation and Economics, and his most recent book, uh, that we're going to talk about today is of the people, by the people, the case for a participatory economy. So welcome to the show. It's great to be on your show again. It's good to have you here again. So why did you write this book? Well, um, Michael Albert and I originally, 20 years ago, wrote, published two books about the idea of a participatory economy. Um, because we wanted to sort of put to rest the notion that you, we only have two choices. You either have to settle for capitalism, you know, a better or worse version, or you have to settle for something like authoritarian planning, sort of the old communism, that those were the only two choices. Um, and there were a number of people who were, who were sort of proclaiming this to be a truth that everybody should accept. And we didn't believe that. Um, we sat down and said, well, all sorts of people, most of the people we know, um, you know, progressive people have always sort of had a very different idea about how the economy should run. That basically workers and consumers could manage themselves and could sort of plan their own interrelated activities, that this was the original vision of socialism. Um, and now they're telling us, no, it's a myth, that it's, that it's impossible. They're literally telling us it's theoretically impossible. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, we don't think so. And we created a set of procedures and said, well, you could decide all these things this way. And clearly, it's, it's not impossible. So that, that was the original motivation, not to allow the lie to persist that we have no choice but to accept capitalism or authoritarian planning. Um, now. The motivation to write this book was really very much had to do with Occupy. Um, I was called by you know, a young activist in Occupy in New York who said, well, we really need to have a new sort of accessible version of this idea because this is what the Occupy people want. Um, they want an economy that's truly participatory and democratic. That's part of what they're saying. They're, they're not only saying that an economy that's run for the 1% you know, in the interest of the 1% and to the detriment of the interest of the 99% is unacceptable and terrible and that Wall Street's the sort of major culprit right now. They're also saying we believe in democracy. We believe in the old American ideal that things should be done democratically, including the economy should be democratic, including workers should have democratic control over their own work lives. Um, and <clears throat> so this, this is a time when sort of this would be a good time to bring out a book that's, and this one is mercifully short, um, that's accessible, it's not written for economists only, um, not even written for people who are sort of already activists, just written for anybody who is out there starting to ask themselves, can't we run the economy in a, in a, in a totally different way, you know, than has led to the mess that we find ourselves in. Um, and originally he and I were supposed to write it together, um, but he became a spokesperson for Occupy Wall Street and is very active in a, an organization called Organization for a Free Society. Um, and he said, well, look, I, I just can't do my share of being a co-author. So can, can you finish this up without me? Because it should come out. People want it now. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. So that, that's, that's how this book came into being. Okay, so uh, talk, talk about what, a, how, how, what does a participatory economy look like? Well, it's actually sort of simple. Um, <coughs> we have production is done in workplaces that are managed by the workers that work there. So we have workers councils that 
organize and manage production. We have what we call neighborhood consumption councils um, that are necessary so that consumers can participate fully in the procedures that, the planning procedures that decide, well, what are we going to produce and how much of this and how much of that. So it's an economy in which you have worker councils and consumer councils. Um, you don't have privately owned corporations with stockholders. You don't um, have them at all? No. Okay. I mean, if you look at our economy today, we have <coughs> production is organized by privately owned, in production is organized and carried out in privately owned corporations, organ, you know, owned by stockholders, mostly major, you know, huge corporations. Um, you look at our economy and all of the resources that people need, including the technologies, you know, that are patented, are privately owned. Um, and <coughs> so the privately owned resources and who, the decision about who gets to use those, those resources is decided through market exchanges. Um, well, in a participatory economy, we don't have corporations and stock run by stockholders insisting that their profits be maximized. These are people who don't work there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the stockholders don't work in the corporations, and yet they are the ones who get to decide what's done there, and they're the ones who say, well, we want you to do things in whatever ways are going to maximize our profits. Um, in a participatory economy, you don't have privately owned corporations. Anybody that works someplace is a member of the workers' council. They have one vote. They have one say. They have voice. Um, and the resources are owned by all of us. Um, we take a huge step and say, all that, all the natural resources out there, they don't belong any more to one person than another. There's a famous quote from, I think it's Chief Joseph, about, well, who would ever think, you know, that the land and the streams belongs to somebody rather than to everybody? Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of an old socialist idea that the means of production, you know, basically are our common heritage that we of this generation have gotten from the past. So. A participatory economy says the natural resources, um, all of the machinery and factory capacity, the technical knowledge about how to use all this, it belongs to all of us, no more to any of us than any others. And it should be treated that way rather than as the private property of some, and if you're lucky enough to own it, then you never have to do any work. Um, so <coughs> now, that's not the same. You still then have to decide, well, but who in particular, which group of workers is going to be using which of these things? You know, these, these things that belong to all of us that we need to produce the things we need. And that's where instead of having a market system, this is a system that is a system of, it's a planned economy, but the planning procedure is qualitatively different from anything that resembles sort of communist authoritarian planning. Um, and it's actually quite different from most common conceptions about well, how would you democratically plan, you know, what the economy is going to do this year? Most conceptions of how to do that is, well, I guess every worker council would have to send a delegate to a meeting, and the delegates at the meeting would work out how are we going to coordinate all this. Um, and we're saying, no, that actually wouldn't work out very well. Um, but there is a procedure that would. And, and that was sort of one of the special features that, that is, that's been spelled out. Um, and I think it's one of the things that has caught on. Um, because at this point, there's actually considerable interest in this proposal. Um, I was invited over for, for you know, a two-week tour of, of Scandinavia and, and, and the UK in the fall. By whom? By a whole bunch of groups that are interested in thinking about what are the alternatives to you know, more of this kind of capitalism that's destroying Europe at the moment. Um, and nobody, want, no, nobody has any interest any longer in, in the kind of, you know, command planning or central planning that, you know, that, that people tried in the 20th say, century. Okay. So when you say no one has any interest in that, there are obviously corporations and very wealthy people in the United States and Europe and around the world that do have an interest in. Well, certainly, yes. Um, corporations and the 1% want us to stick with the system we've got. Um, they have spent a lot of time trying to convince us that the only alternative was that failed experiment of communism. 
Um, I mean, interestingly enough, if you take a look at people who call themselves socialists in, in, in places in the world, they're, they've said very loud and clear, Venezuela is the best example. And Venezuela has said very loudly and clearly now for over 10 years, well, we believe in socialism, but the kind of socialism we believe in in the 21st century certainly isn't you know, anything that resembles the communist system, which was a single party political system. They said, we don't believe in that. Um, we're committed to electoral democracy and a multi-party electoral democracy. And we have absolutely no interest in sort of a centrally planned economy with a central planning bureau or a central planning board that essentially is collecting information and then telling everybody in the economy, you have to do this, you have to do that. We're not interested in that. The, the Venezuelans you know, told the Cubans in no, in no uncertain terms, you know, we have no interest in you coming over here and teaching us how to run our economy the way that you've been running your economy for the mm -hmm. past 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that one of the things that's happened is that, and, and this, has another, this, ha this has to do also with sort of the purpose of writing a book like this. I think many people out there say to themselves, and, and it's quite reasonable, well, we have so much to do. There is so much wrong. We have to, we have to fight against, we, you know, we have to fight to do something about climate change. We have to fight to do something about the unemployment. We have to fight to do something about sort of saving unions and saving Social Security and Medicare. There's so much to do and so little time and so few of us to do it. Why spend any time or, you know, why is it a, a priority to think about, you know, an alternative to running the, yes, we can say we want system change, but why think hard about system change? Why spend a lot of time doing that? Um, and I think there's sort of two really good answers to that, and that's um, this, is, this is in part an answer to your question: What's the motivation for writing a book like this? What would be? The, why would anybody want to read a book on this subject? Um, one is that we do know, in the end, we need system change. Um, that's how we're going to solve the problems, and that's how we're going to get economies that actually, you know, work for people. Um, and that's, actually, that's also part of the motivation of the title. I think one of the lessons of history is, unless the economy is of the people and by the people, it will not be for the people. It will be for whoever actually is running it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we've discovered sort of time and time again. So and, we- And just, just yeah. most recently here in Oregon, of course we had Nike going to the governor uh, and saying, uh, if you'll give us uh, special consideration uh, and promise not to change the tax structure for 30, I think they originally asked for 40 years and got 30 right. years, uh, then we will make some investments in Oregon. And so uh, a, a clear example where the decisions are not really being made by us. That, absolutely. Here, I mean, this is an example of, well, Nike owns the technology, Nike owns the jobs, and they're basically coming, and they come and they negotiate with the state of Oregon saying, you must give us more of this um, or we simply will threaten to leave. Um, and I, I thought it was incredibly interesting that Intel you know, very quickly said, well, wait a minute, you can't do this for Nike and not do it for Intel. Okay. And then, of course, every business in Oregon that, mm -hmm. you know, has, should ask the same question. Right. And, and, and the Oregon legislators immediately bought into it and said, of course, it would only be fair. Right. <laughs> um, that's why you can't allow, you can't allow the technology and the resources to be privately owned because it will be taken advantage of. Um, and that we, that's, that's a perfect example of that. Um, but in the big picture, unless, this, unless we run the, unless we the people, you know, unless the economy is of us, um, and unless it's by us, we're doing the managing the decision, the, the, the decision making, then I think that the lessons of history are that it's, uh, sooner or later it ceases to be for us. Um, sooner or later, the people who have the control over these decisions or they have the resources so that they can basically threaten, um, you know, and get their way, 
that it will run in their interest rather than our interests. And that's what the Occupy Wall Street movement sort of finally got the way, you know, the, they finally brought that to the popular attention here in the United States. This is a system that's basically serving the interests of the 1% to the detriment of the 99%. Um, in any case, so I think that, that one reason, one reason for sort of thinking about this is that it isn't, you know, the answer was not, it's not self-evident how you would run things differently. Um, and we can no longer point to some country that has somehow done it miraculously and say, well, we just want to do it that way. Um, that's not that. So it's something that has to be thought out. The other thing that I think is very important is if you go back in history and look at, right now we have a huge economic crisis and we have movements that are sort of rising in opposition to you know, the, the obstacles that are being thrown in the way of solving the problems we have. Um, well, that's not, this isn't the first time that's happened. Um, there was a huge capitalist crisis in the 30s. There were huge capitalist crises back in the 1890s and the early 20th century. If you look at the movements, you know, the progressive movements that were, you know, responding to those crises and were saying we have to have changes, in many ways those movements were more powerful and more effective than ours has been so far today. And I think one of the reasons for that is in the early 20th century, even though nobody had ever seen a different kind of economy, there was a good hardcore in those movements fighting against sort of Dickinsonian, terribly ugly and you know, inhumane capitalism, who were firmly convinced, had no doubts whatsoever that there was an, there was a, that we could definitely do far better than that. And they had an idea about how that was, and they were firmly convinced. Um, in the 30s, there was a hard core you know, of leadership and activists in these movements to create the unions and to fight for social security. Part of the reason those fights were so successful is there was a hard core of people in those movements who were firmly convinced there was a whole better way to do things. We didn't need the capitalists. We didn't need the CEOs of the Wall Street banks that we could run our economies ourselves far better. Um, I think that when the communist system collapsed, um, now the, the people who believed what they believed in the 30s basically believed in a false god, but they had certainty. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely convinced. And it created a kind of a hard edge and a hard core of commitment and belief that I think is really essential to making you know, reform campaigns and struggles more successful. And I think that we have to reestablish that. Um, and the only way to reestablish that is to do the hard thinking about, well, could we do it differently? And can we work it out? And can we come to an understanding that we don't have to agree on all the details, but can we come to an understanding that, you know, we can actually run our own economies far better than these people that are mismanaging the economies in their interests and against our interests. We have to reestablish a kind of a firm belief in that possibility, I think that's part of making fights for just saving Social Security more successful. Um, so I think that's the other reason that uh, that's devoting some time and energy while, while you're out there fighting the good fight and all the different ways in which we have to. I think that's why it is wise for us to spend some of our time just reconsolidating our thoughts and our conviction about how much we don't need this system at all. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it is difficult uh, as you struggle for on so many of these different levels and campaigns and uh, to uh, see a larger picture. Yes. And that's partly why we're not really successful because we go from one campaign to the next campaign, uh, never really being successful at any of them and never really envisioning what, well, what, what kind of vision we, we're striving for. No, I think that's right, that, that a vision of a larger picture, I think, makes fighting more successful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of the reason that, and I don't mean to belittle, you know, 
I don't mean to belittle whether in Europe or in the United States or wherever, you know, all the people who have risen up in this economic crisis to, you know, to fight, to save Social Security, to protect unions in the state of Wisconsin, et cetera, et cetera. I don't mean to belittle, to belittle those people in their efforts at all. Um, but I think that if we, I think being convinced that there is a larger picture and that there is a system change that is feasible and possible and that we can do this, it just stiffens the resolve. Mm -hmm. um, when they tell you, you have to accept this, to know, well, even if we have to accept this right now as the best deal we can get, I know, I know that, that's, that this isn't enough and I know that there's no reason, there's no actual reason that we couldn't really have, you know, a generous social security system, a really good medical care system. Um, so that, that, I think that's the other sort of purpose that I had in mind at this particular juncture. You know, why do you want to sort of write something that will allow more people, you know, it's more accessible to more people, draw more people, people into just thinking through how much better we could do mm -hmm. if we just went, sat down and started thinking about doing these things ourselves instead of allowing somebody else or some market system to do it for us. Okay. Are, there, are there any examples of existing places that have used uh, participatory? Well, it, it, it's, it's sort of a yes and no answer. Um, there is one time in history when literally tens of millions of workers and peasants um, for a period of three or four years, ran, an ran a very successful economy, um, pretty much along these lines, where you had you know, workers' councils and peasant councils and communal councils sort of deciding how to produce things, coordinating the sort of planning how it was that this factory was going to send this to that factory that needed, et cetera. And it, it was in Spain. Um, during the time of the Spanish Civil War. Um, and everybody, every economic historian who has seriously looked at that economy in Spain that, and the way it ran for those three or four years has actually you know, come to the conclusion that it was remarkably productive, it was remarkably successful. Now, it was, they lost the Civil War and you know, they were then crushed by Franco and fascism. Um, but that would be the example in history where, you know, a whole section of a large national modern economy um, ran this way. And, and my reading of the evidence is it worked pretty damn well. Yeah. Um, now, other than that, what can you say? Well, other than that, what you can say is, well, there are places in the world today where many of the parts of this overall vision, you know, are practiced. Um, the famous example of participatory budgeting that started in Porto Alegre, Brazil, and then spread to the rest of Brazil. In Venezuela, um, you have communal councils, you have municipal assemblies, um, you have a whole, you know, in, in every city and town in Venezuela, um, the kind of stuff that's talked about, you know, as more of a whole system, um, you know, has been practiced in Venezuela, you know, over the past five or six years, and it's been very successful. The other thing that's happened is that there are people out there now who are organizing something that in the United States and Europe gets called the new economy. Um, workers co-ops, um, local agriculture, um, participatory budgeting. Um, there are all sorts of sort of there's a movement now that's a rather large movement. Um, one of the people who writes the most about it and who's sort of a, a, a very, you know, a very effective proponent of building the new economy is Garl Perovitz. And this new economy is basically an economy that is based not on private corporations for profit. Um, sometimes it's corporations committed to a triple bottom line. Um, but it's a whole, the idea is this is a whole different way. It, it, this is a different kind of an economy and we are building it in the here and now in the ashes of a system that's failing us. Um, and if you take a look at the elements of this new economy, these are elements where in one way or another, it's people making their own decisions in their own neighborhoods, in their own locales, in their own workplaces, 
and basically demonstrating that it works better for us than when we allow corporations to be our job providers and our order givers. Excellent. Thank you very much for being here, Robin. Hey, it was great being on the show. Good, good. So we've been talking with Robin Hanel, who is uh, author of Of the People, By the People, The Case for a Participatory Economy. Let's see, I also want to make an announcement. In January 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court issued their Citizens United decision allowing corporations and unions to spend from their treasuries on political campaigns. Uh, and corporations have done so with a vengeance. Uh, in this last year, political uh, spending uh, broke all previous records, and much of that money ha on Fortress was not traceable, and we don't really know who was contributing to it. But the problem of money in politics is, only the pro is not the only problem threatening America's democracy. Corporate personhood, the court created notion that corporations are persons with constitutional rights is an equal if not greater threat. Therefore, the Alliance for Democracy has joined with like-minded organizations to call for a constitutional amendment to end the, th the twin threatening doctrines, money equals speech and corporate personhood. Uh, in Oregon, we have created Oregonians to restore constitutional democracy, and we are advocating that the Oregon state legislature adopt a resolution calling for uh, our congressional delegations to send them a constitutional amendment, which we then can ratify. You can help in this, e in this effort. Go to our re website at www.oregonrestoresdemocracy.org and sign up to visit your state senator and representative. Ask them to sponsor or at least to vote in favor of our suggested resolution. We will team you up with others w wanting to visit those same people. One result of the 2012 election was that the desire of the American people to end those doctrines that money equals speech and that corporations are persons has never been stronger or clearer. Now we need to turn that desire into legislative action. Again, visit OregonRestoresDemocracy.org and join the action. We can do this. If our democracy is not to descend into plutocracy, we must do this. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more about the Alliance for Democracy, visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org. I want to thank our crew today. Our crew has been Roger Bates, Dave King, Joan Horton, and Tom Thomas. And thank you, audience, for watching, and I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.